great deal of understanding the scripture has to do with how you read it. There's so much revelation packed into the first couple of words of this verse, it's almost staggering. It starts, really, you can look it up in any Bible translation. Uh, if you go on the internet, you just look up 20 different translations of the Bible. They all start the same way regarding this verse, and that's strange because normally translations will differ, uh, especially with how the sentence starts. But regardless of the translation that you read, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, always starts like this, now faith. Uh, you got to understand how he's saying it. He's not saying, now faith. He's saying, now faith. In other words, he's raising the concept, or the precept rather, that faith is always now. now. If it's not now, it's not faith. In other words, I can't use faith right now that I used 10 years ago because it's not now. I can't use faith now that I used a year ago or even last week because each present moment requires that you walk in a now faith. Faith is always now. Look at somebody, smile at them, show them your pearly whites and say, faith is always now. It's always now. I think uh, perhaps the greatest example of human faith in the Bible, or at least the, the flashiest example of human faith in the Bible, is Peter walking on the water. Some of you remember the story, you know, uh, the disciples are in the boat and they see something out on the water. They think it's a ghost. Peter says, looks like Jesus. Jesus said, don't be afraid, it's me. Peter said, I tell you what, I still ain't convinced that's not a ghost. If it's really you, tell me to come walk to you on the water. And Jesus said, okay, come. So when Jesus says come, Peter literally takes a step of faith out of the boat onto the water. And he is standing there in now faith. Now, you know the story. 30 seconds later, he's sinking. And, you know, the, the scripture says when he saw the waves. So, so he's standing there in now faith, but a new threat starts coming toward him. Okay? He didn't see the wave before when he stepped out on the boat. So he steps out. He's in now faith, but a new threat, like a, a wave, just a new threat, like a wave. It just comes rolling in. And the threat got him out of now faith and into fear. And when he was in fear, he started to sink. When you are walking in now faith, it is the enemy's job to send new threats into your now to take you out of now faith. And what Peter failed to realize when he's looking at the new threat, I mean, first of all, he shouldn't have been able to stand on the water anyway. So his mind is in amazement at what he's doing now. You know, he's standing on the boat one second. You know, Jesus gives the word. He steps out in faith according to the word. And what he's standing in now is different than what he was standing in on the boat. But while he was on the boat, the threat was that the storm was going to cause the boat to sink. When he steps out of that situation, he is no longer concerned about the threat that was coming five minutes ago. So the enemy knows he's standing on the water now. I can't get him with the threat of sinking the boat. So I've got to send a new threat to the now. No matter how many threats you overcome in your life, the enemy, like waves, 
It's endless. He will constantly send new threats based off where you are standing now. Because if you've been walking for the Lord any amount of time, you are not right now where you were five days ago, five months ago, five years ago. So as you progress and your standing changes, the waves that the enemy sends against you has to change. So he sends the waves to your now to try to pull you out of now faith. Say it. Faith is always now. And Peter fails to consider what we fail to consider. That if God was strong enough to hold him up on water, then God was strong enough to keep him up if that wave crashed against him. And this is what some of us fail to consider because many of us came into the room today all worried about a new wave of threats, okay? But what you fail to consider is if God was strong enough to keep you last year. Anybody remember 2020? Do you remember all of the threats that the enemy threw at all of us in 2020? Not only your health, but your finances, your family, your mental health, your business, your future, your country. Everything that could be thrown at us was thrown at us in 2020. And if God was able to be a protector last year and a provider last year, if he was able to be a comforter last year, if he was able to be a defense last year, if he was able to bless you in the midst of turmoil and difficulty last year, then why is it that you're standing in this year worried about a new wave coming against you, worried about a new threat coming against you? If he was strong enough, then he's strong enough. Faith is always now. Push somebody and say it. Faith is always now. So how do I maintain? The question, if that's true, then how do I maintain Come on, if that's true, how do I maintain now faith? And the simple answer is you have to keep the word of God coming at you constantly. Because Romans 10 says that faith comes. Faith comes. Faith comes. It's perpetual. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. Hearing it both taught and hearing it preached. Uh, Preaching will save you, the scripture says, and keep you saved. And then teaching is important because teaching destroys unbelief. So you have to constantly have a steady stream of the word of God flowing into you because the words you got last week will not help you this week because last Last week is over. It may have been a good word. It may have been a good week, but it is over. A new week is starting today. And so because I've got to face a new week starting today, I need a new word because I got to have now faith. I got to have a now word. And God designed the church. If it's a healthy church, if it's a biblical church, God designed the church in an amazing way that when you come to church on Sunday, and sit up under the preaching of the word, faith comes. That's what's happening right now as I'm preaching. Faith's coming. Different people, different levels, you know, some really high, some really low, but faith is coming. And you cannot believe what you have not heard about, and you cannot receive and understand what you have not been taught. It would be like having a rich uncle that left you $50 million, but you didn't know him. He didn't have no way to get in touch with you, and your inheritance is just sitting there over your head, but you're not receiving it because of ignorance. So many people live below the station of life that they could have because they have either not been taught the principles of the Word of God, or they've been taught them and refused to apply them. They, they think that, you know, twice a month is faithful church attendance. Everybody in that section just left me right there. 
Now, I mean, that's according to the Pew survey. You know, the Pew survey says that today in America, faithful churchgoers consider themselves faithful if they go to church twice a month. You are out of your ever-loving mind. You cannot survive spiritually only eating two times a month. But your priorities are backwards. You don't understand where you need to be spiritually, and it's why you're having the warfare you're having, because you are not in the right place to receive what God is sending you. It's God's responsibility to send you the word you need to have now faith, but it is not his responsibility to make sure you show up in the right place to receive what he sent. And Sunday after Sunday, it's very possible that the word you need to get through the challenge you're facing is being sent right here, but you weren't here to receive it. Not God's fault, not my fault. That's you and you alone. And you could have so much more, you could be so much stronger, you could have so much more victory, but you weren't here to get the word that you needed to produce the now faith necessary to stay standing even with the waves crashing all around you. You know, these people, these people, they like, they like freak me out, you know, they, 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 they don't put an importance on church attendance, and then they think, if they do go to church, they think any church will do. Everything with a steeple in it and a microphone on the stage isn't a church. You know, any church will do. Any barber won't do. <laughs> Ladies, any hair salon won't do. You know any nail salon won't do. Why is it that we're so finicky over where we get our hair cut and our nails done, but we really don't have the same level of value and importance for who serves us the everlasting immutable truths of the Word of God? Say faith is always now. Say faith is always now. We need faith coming constantly. Because the word of God preached that will produce faith acts as a preservative, a preservative to your spirit so that before the trial comes, before the new wave of threat comes, if you've been in church, you've got the word you need to stand before the wave ever hits you. That's why if you wise up in the spirit, you'll learn. You can almost kind of tell how your week or your month is going to go based off the word that was preached to you on Sunday because God wouldn't be talking to you about it if you didn't need it in your spirit for what you were about to face. God is a faithful father and he's a good provider. He wouldn't let the need come and attack you without giving you the provision before it ever came. Faith is always now. Faith is always now. Faith is always now. <laughs> Hebrews 11, 1, now faith is uh, the substance. Yeah. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Let's, let's deal with that substance. The Amplified said that it was the assurance and that it was the confidence. It said something else. Do you remember? It said it was the title deed, right? Then another translation says it's the purchasing power. Everybody say purchasing power. Substance equals purchasing power. If you got that note, put it on or somebody might want to take a picture of it. Substance equals purchasing power. Say it again, purchasing power. Let me offend your sensibilities for a minute. Faith is in the spirit world what currency money is in the natural world. Can you see this? You know what it is? It's a hundred dollar bill. Now, I'm going to use it for an illustration, but pay attention because at the end I'm going to give it away. No, I mean, really, I'm just, I'm going to use it, and then I'm going to give it away. <laughs> we'll see how much faith you got. Um, it's 
in this country, this is worth $100. But really, this isn't worth anything. This is paper with some green stamping on it and an ugly guy on the front. <laughs> this isn't worth anything. Our country has to tell us that this is worth something. This paper has no value. The country has to assign value and tell us this is worth $100. It's not like gold. Gold is valuable because of what it's made out of. It's not like diamonds. Diamonds are valuable because they're diamonds. This isn't valuable because it's paper. It's valuable because it is a medium for exchange. All right. Now, if I were to take this same $100 bill to Europe, its value goes down instantly from $100 to $84. I, 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 get, I step on a plane from New York, okay? $100. I fly seven hours to London, $84. I lost $16 in the air. Why? Because in Europe, they operate according to a different system, a different kingdom, you might say. Right? And so what's valuable in this kingdom in America is devalued when I take it to another kingdom or another system that operates according to the euro. Okay? Now, I want you to think and realize in the same way, if you take your faith into the world's system, if you take it out of this kingdom and you take it into the world system, it's immediately devalued. You know, why would you go to church on Sunday on your only day off? Why would you do that? Why do you lift your hands and sing and scream and stand up and holler at the preacher who's screaming at you? There's just a whole bunch of screaming going on. What are you doing? Why would you get off work on Wednesday night and grab fast food and get the kids together and go to Bible study? And, and why would you give your money to that church? You must be out of your ever-loving mind. They don't value this currency in that system. The world system values money. The kingdom of God system values faith. But what the world system doesn't realize is faith is to us what money is to them. It's a medium for exchange. You understand what I'm saying? Now, this ain't really worth anything. I can't eat it. I can't wear it. You know, I can't drive it. But I sure can exchange it for any of those things. So even though this is just paper with an ugly fat guy on the face of it, it becomes valuable to me the moment I decide to exchange one thing for another. And it's the same thing with your faith. Now, the world system... They got healed because they had money and they could afford the best doctor. They could afford experimental medications. They could afford the best therapy and the best hospitals. And they got their healing because they trusted money. But you got your healing because standing in the kingdom of God, you had the nerve to believe in faith 
that by his stripes we are healed and that healing is the children's bread. They got healed because of their money. You got healed because of your faith. They got promoted because they had the money to go to school and the best schools and get the diploma and get all the education that they needed. And when they arrived in the job, they started climbing the ladder because they had spent the money to get the education. You got the promotion and never went to college, didn't have half of the experience, but you got people working for you that combined spent over a million dollars on their education. How is it possible? They had money. You had faith in the favor of of God. You understood that one moment of God's favor is better than a lifetime of understanding. That one moment of God's favor can elevate somebody like Joseph who was in the prison one day and at the right hand of the Pharaoh the next day and the only difference was the favor of God was applied to his life. And there ought to be more people standing because I know some of your testimonies. I know there's people in here that got jobs you know you don't qualify for. Live in houses you didn't qualify for have credit score you don't know how you got that credit score it was your faith in the favor somebody ought to give him a praise right there somebody ought to give him a praise right there oh yes oh yes you got there with money I got there with faith I'm glad to see Ida Scott. She got her car fixed finally. It's good to see you back in the house of the Lord. Come get this $100. I won't give it to you. Give Ida a hand. Come on down here. Yeah. Amen. Oh, give her a big hand. She paid a big price to be here today. If I say now, faith. Say, now faith. Now faith. Say, faith is my purchasing power. No, say it. Faith is my purchasing power. So I, I get the faith from the word from my now. And then I take that purchasing power and I reach past the veil of the natural realm into the supernatural realm with my faith, that exchange medium, I get what I need from the supernatural realm, pull it back into the natural, and that's called manifestation. You know? Now, this can be seen the clearest when the need that you have is not possible in the natural realm. So you got to pay a bill and you just don't have the money. It's not possible. You go to the spirit world with your faith, which is a medium for exchange. You reach into the spirit world with your faith, take the financial miracle that you need. How many people, don't lie, how many people have ever seen God give you a financial miracle that made no sense? You know what all these people did? No, listen, listen, listen. You know what they did? They were standing in the natural where it was impossible. They took now faith and stuck out that exchange arm into the spirit. Took what they need out of the spirit by faith. Pulled it into the natural. And they called it a financial miracle. Really, it was an exchange. Okay. That's what faith is. It's just a medium for exchange. Okay. Everybody say, now faith. Now, faith. now Hebrews 11 verse 6. Still teaching about faith, he says, without faith, it is impossible to please him, him being God. Uh, for he who comes, uh, that, that word please there, just incidentally, means access. So without faith, it's impossible to access God or the realm he resides in, supernatural realm. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe don't skip over that. He that comes to God must believe that he is, not that he was, not that he will be. Why? 
Because faith is always. He that comes to God must believe that he is. In other words, whatever he was in the Old Testament, he is. If he was a way maker for the Israelites in the Old Testament, he is. If he was a deliverer then, he is. If he was a covenant keeper for Abraham, he is. If he was a redeemer, he is. A provider, he is. Protection, he is. Whatever he was, he is. And whatever you have need of this morning, let me fix one thing that materialistic Christians can struggle and stumble with. God doesn't mind blessing you, and he doesn't mind blessing you with material things, but you have to have your focus and your understanding right. A lot of people came here this morning focused on what God has. When you approach God for what he has, you've missed the greatest part. Because see, it's not that it's not that God has what I need. <laughs> he is what I need. So you came in the building and you need healing. And, and, and you're trying to approach God and in your mind you think you're coming to God and, and God's there and then God has healing like on a shelf he can throw down. No, 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 that's not how it works. When you're coming to God, you have to believe that it's not that he has healing, it's that he, he is healing. You come to God because you got a problem and you don't know what to do and you need wisdom. It, it's not that God has wisdom, it's that God is wisdom. You come to God because you need a financial miracle. It's not that God has finances, it's that he is finances. Whatever you need, it's not that he has it, it's that he is. You got to settle that in your mind before you approach God. Don't approach if you can't approach with the understanding of he is. God, if I can just get you, I know whatever I need will be solved if I can just get get you. If I can pull you into the situation, I don't need nothing else but you. If I can pull you into my family life, I don't need nothing else but you. If I can pull you into my finances, I don't need nothing else but you. If I can pull you into my health, I don't need nothing else but you. Because he is. That's why when Moses asked God, who should I tell Pharaoh sent me? God said, just tell him, I am that I am sent you. In other words, whatever I need to be, whenever my people need me to be it, it's not that I have what they need. I am what they need. I'll become a river in a desert. I'll become a mountain of defense. I'll become a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. I'll become quail to blow in in the evening. I'll become man of falling down out of heaven. I will be what they need. And this morning, God is telling you to stop focusing on stuff and start focusing on him. Because if you can get him, the stuff is in. Somebody throw your head back and holler, he is. He is. He is. Yes, he is. Ah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He is. He is. I'm starting to feel the glory now. He is. He is. He is. He that cometh to God must believe that he is. Hebrews 11, verse 6. He that cometh to God must believe that here, you're going to help me preach in a minute. He that cometh to God must believe that and that he is and he is a rewarder. You know what that means in just real simple layman's terms? He is what I need, and he wants to give it to me. 
must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Seeking God has side effects. In fact, God told me to tell you there's a blessing coming to every single one of you just because you came to his house to seek him this morning. One person already got blessed. If God's doing it for one, he'll do it in the whole. If he'll do it for the 10%, he'll do it for the 90. There's a reward coming your way. The Bible said it. I didn't say it. There's a reward coming your way. Somebody say he is. Now, faith is the substance of things hope for now faith so the question is once we receive faith what do we do with it and this is an important question because James writes in his epistle that faith even though it's real faith that faith without works is dead being alone it's like if you have a car battery and you got those two leads, you know, uh, a negative and a positive. The negative can be in the battery and just be just fine. But if you don't have a positive, the battery is dead. The positive can be in the battery and the positive can be just fine. You know, the knob can be there for you to hook the jumper cables on. But, but if you don't have the negative there, even though the positive is there and even though it's real and even though it's legit, without the negative, the battery is still dead. You need both components at the same time to have the charge. Same thing with faith. Once faith is in you, it may be legitimate and it may be real. But if it is never hooked up, matched up, synced up with your works, your actions, then that faith, real as it may be, is dead. In other words, real faith demands that you do something with it or it dies. Look at somebody say, do it now. Oh, starting to feel preachy in the room right now. Do it now. So, so Luke 17 in our text there were 10 men. I guess you could call them men. Leprosy was almost finished, turning them into nothing. Infection was oozing out of the pores of their body. Their muscle tissue had rotted, and they, they felt like mush to touch. Their bodies were rotting on the bone, decomposing while they were still alive. And you know, leprosy is an insidious disease. It takes things from you while it kills you. There's a lot of diseases that will kill you, but it leaves your body intact at least. Leprosy will kill you. It'll take a toe one day and, and a finger the next, part of your ear the next, tip of your nose the next. It'll just cause you to fall apart. And to add insult to injury, lepers had to announce their ailment if any healthy people got close to them. Unclean, unclean, don't get too close. Most of the time, lepers lived in colonies, separated off by themselves, because when people can't cure you, they like to label you and group you with other people like you and put you out of sight, out of mind. But these lepers had wandered away from the colony because they knew if you want to get healed, you can't stay surrounded by people that have the same issues you have. I'm going to say that again. If you want to be healed, you have to separate yourself from an environment that's just as sick as you are. So they wandered away from the colony. Glory to God. If you want to get healed, you have to separate yourself from an environment that is as sick as you are. So they wandered away from the colony. If you want to be healed, you have to separate yourself from the environment that is as sick as you are. So they wandered away from the colony. And... Uh, you know, their clothes smelled like waste, their bodies smelled like death, and death was working on them and had almost finished its job when they heard that Jesus was passing by. Now, the scripture doesn't tell us who had told them about Jesus or, you know, who had preached the word to them. 
But I know that some preacher had because when they heard Jesus was passing by, their thoughts immediately went to, he heals lepers. He heals sick people. He raises the dead. And immediately upon hearing about Jesus coming by, faith leaped in their hearts. So faith comes by. So now they've got faith coming at them, right? They, they heard that, that Jesus was passing by. Next, they believed that he is. In other words, they, they took what they had heard that he had done in the past. They had to do this. They took what they had heard that he had done in the past. And they applied it to their now. Because faith is always. So they said, if he healed past lepers, he could heal this leper. Because I don't just believe that he was. I believe that he is. The third thing they believed is that he was a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And I know they believed that because not only were they sitting there fully convinced that he had healed other people and could heal them, they had the nerve to believe that he would if they asked him to. So, according to all the scriptural staples, we got real faith here with these lepers. But real faith without works is dead. So what did they do with their faith? Luke 17, 12. Luke 17, 12. Look at what they did. It says in Luke, I'm sorry, I snuck that in on you. I didn't give you no time to pull that up there. It's all right. Go ahead. Luke 17, 12. When he's entering a certain village. Do you see it? What's it say? Hold on. He's entering a certain village and what happened? There met, there met him. Ten men. In, in other words, they got up from where they were. They didn't just sit there wishing, hoping, and praying that he would come to them. They got up from where they were, and they went, and they met him. But, but watch. But they were still afar off. Why is that? I'm sure when they saw him, you know, when they saw him, he was passing through. I'm sure when they saw him and they felt all that faith, I'm sure they wanted to run and chase him down. But they probably couldn't because they lost too many toes. In other words, the natural circumstances prevented them from getting as close as they wanted to. I, I, I'm sure they wanted to fall down at his feet. But you know, that knee ain't been working right for three and a half years. They, they couldn't get as close as they wanted to. So what do you do when you have faith and you believe God for a miracle, but your natural circumstances prevent you from getting as close as you want to? Point number one, get as close as you can. Get as close as you can. They, 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 they went and they met him even though they were afar off. Now, you, you may have some goals and some dreams and some things, things you're hoping for. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. But your natural circumstances may be preventing you from getting as close as you want. And you're wondering, should I just sit here? Should I just sit on this business decision? Should I just sit on this plan? Should I just sit on this dream? No, Take your faith and give it some action and get as close as you can. I knew I was going to have to work this point. Pastor, I heard you preaching about God can make you debt free, but I just got so much debt. There ain't no way I can get out of debt this year. Get as close as you can. And begin to do it. Now, oh, you don't hear what I'm saying. Pastor, I can't start the business. I just don't have the capital. Get as close as you can. And don't sit and twiddle your thumbs while you're waiting. Do it now. Pastor, I'm not healthy enough to lose weight. And I'm not, I'm not healthy enough to exercise. Or I can't afford a gym membership. If you can't afford a gym membership, walk around your neighborhood. 
I knew you wouldn't shout on that. I knew every butt was staying in every seat on that one. If you can't go to Gold's Gym, walk around your neighborhood. If you can't walk around your neighborhood, walk around your house. If you can't walk around your house, sit down in your dining room chair and then stand up and do it 50 times. Get as close as you can. That's a prophetic word for somebody you've been waiting too long, hoping too long, wishing too long, praying too long. Take the faith that you got in you now and do something. That's worth giving God a praise right there. They got as close as they could you know what movies bug me the most? It's like when you got, you know, somebody on a lifeboat and they've been on the lifeboat the whole movie, you know. And in the far distance, there is a ship, a rescue ship passing by, you know. Or somebody's on an island and they see a rescue plane uh, going by. And they can see it. But it... You know, the, the, the lepers, when they saw Jesus, Jesus was, he's not coming to the, he's passing by. I wish I could tell you that the text reads that Jesus was coming to see him because he just loved him so much and knew they was hurting so bad. No! This miracle was not part of Jesus' earthly ministry's agenda. Heaven didn't schedule this. The lepers did with their faith. Jesus, he's, the, the text said he's, he's a far off and he just, he's just walking by. And they, they got as close as they could, but none of their physical gifts are working really to go and get him. My hips aren't working. My knees aren't working. My feet aren't working. You know, I, I, leprosy's been tearing me apart. And a lot of people would have accomplished a lot more by now if it weren't for the things that came to tear you apart. It's not that you were lazy. It's that you, you were losing fingers and toes while other people were running, living their best life. It's not that you didn't have a good work ethic, but it's hard to work when you lost your nose and part of your ear this morning. You know, when life sends circumstances that tear you apart and rob you of the giftedness of your strength. You know, strength is a gift. And they're standing so close to their breakthrough, but the circumstances that have torn them apart are limiting them and to the people who are down and you want to get with this message but all the reminders of all of the things you've lost and all the things that aren't working it's keeping you in despair listen you may have lost a lot of things the lepers lost a lot of things but the bible said they did have one thing left God is so faithful, even if you've lost a lot, even if everything else is not working, he'll always leave you one thing that is working. And the text says in verse 13, they used the one thing they had left, the one thing that was working. The scripture says they lifted up their voice. I can't use my arms to wave you down. I can't use my legs to chase you down. But God did leave me one thing that still works. And they lifted up their voice and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy. Point number two, use what is working. <laughs> You're so down and depressed and focused on what's not working that you have failed to recognize the power in what God left you. 
and what God did leave working in your life. And I'm telling you, no matter what else has broke down on you, if you will take the faith that you have, now faith, and then pair it with what is still working, you can receive any miracle that you need in your life if you do it. Use what is working. Did you get that number two? Use what is working. And then... Uh, num number three, they, they said, uh, they said, Jesus, master, have mercy. And they had to use a loud voice because there's a timing. Oh, Holy Spirit, help me. There's a timing component to this text. There's a timing component to this message. If they would have refused to God to, to get up, when they first heard he was coming by and hobbled their way over as close as they could. If they would have refused to lift up their voice in the moment they did, they would have been just out of his earshot. They had a small window of opportunity, but they had to do it. Somebody in this room, you got a small window of opportunity for that business, for that investment, for uh, the, the thing you're wanting to launch, the thing you wanted to do, the thing in the relationship, the thing with the kids, the thing with the house, the thing with the refinance, the thing with whatever it is. You got a small window of opportunity and you need to take your faith and do it now. Now, I ain't screaming and I ain't spitting, but that's a prophetic word if I've ever given you one. Do it now. These words are the reason I'm preaching this message. Do it now. No more fear. No more intimidation. No more worry. No more allowing the waves of threats that the enemy is sending to cause you to sink, to be effective in causing you to drown in what God said you could have. You need to do it and you need to do it now. I got to keep saying it till somebody gets it. You need to do it and you need to do it now. Hear the word of the Lord. You need to do it and you need to do it. They, notice what they said. Jesus, master, have mercy. Point number three. Miracles happen. Listen to this now. Miracles happen when God's mercy and your action collide. Miracles happen when God's mercy and your action collide. Verse 14. After they cried out, the Bible says, he saw them. I want to tell somebody that came in here and you feel invisible in your life. You've been feeling lately like you are invisible. And the enemy's been using that terminology. I picked up on it prophetically. He's been using that word, invisible. Nobody sees you. They don't notice you. They don't recognize you. They don't value who you are. They, and, and you came in here and you feel invisible. First of all, imagine how invisible the lepers felt to the rest of society. The story with the leper proves that it doesn't matter what you're going through or what's going on with you. If you call out to Jesus, he sees you. And I just want to tell somebody who's been feeling invisible, God sees you. In fact, that ought to change your perception of yourself. Because what difference does it make if you don't see me, if I know that God sees me? For me to be depressed because you don't see me, 
is to devalue the vision and the recognition of God. If I know God sees me, you don't have to see me. You don't have to like me. You don't have to be nice to me. You don't have to value me. If God sees me, push somebody, spread this message across the church. Tell them God sees you. Come on, spread it. God sees you. Now, he saw him. He saw him. What did he see? He saw people that had used their faith to get as close as they can. They couldn't get as close as they wanted to. They got as close as they can. Then they used what was still working. And then number three, they threw out their action to collide with his mercy. So in verse 14, the Bible says, when Jesus saw them, Uh, Luke 17, verse 14. When Jesus saw them, look at this. This is beautiful to me. When he saw them, he laid hands on them. Is that what the text said? When he saw them, he went over and prayed for them. Is that what the text said? When he saw them, he gave them an anointed prayer cloth. When he saw them, he knew they needed a miracle. Because they weren't there for any other reason. They were there because they, they were hoping for the leprosy to be cured. And faith is just, all it is is the substance, the medium for exchange, the purchasing power of things that you're hoping for. They were hoping to be healed. So when he saw them, he instantly knew what they needed. And knowing what they needed, instead of laying hands or instead of praying, he gave them a word. Because when you need a miracle, what you really need is a word of instruction. Because all through the Bible, supernatural miracles and instructions are tied together. So instead of saying, Father, please do it, he gives them what everybody who really needs a miracle has to have. He gives them an instruction. Because the faith that they used to get up and the faith that they used to hobble over to where they were afar off from him and the faith that they used to cry out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us, that was good faith. And it had brought them a long way, but it was over. In order to be healed, they needed now faith. And now faith requires a now word. God, I hope you know how good this is. So he tells them, go, show yourself to the priest. Keep verse 14 up there. He tells them, go, show yourself to the priest. Uh, do you know how hard it was to get over here? I mean, is there like something you could do like right here or on the spot? That's the problem with miracles. And it's the problem sometimes with faith. Because the next level always requires that you go. And if you're going to go in that faith, then you got to do it. So they couldn't sit down and talk about it. They couldn't sit down and count the cost. What if this don't work? If they were going to do it, they had to do it. Now, so it says, go show yourself to the priest. And when they made the decision to put their action now behind this word, this now faith, the Bible says, and so it was as they went. That means they got a little bit better every step of faith they took. <laughs> to those who have lost, to those who've been in a season where you're falling apart, steps are painful. 
But point number four, if somehow you can keep on walking, using the faith you got to keep putting one foot in front of the other, if you can somehow keep on walking with the last word God gave you, then the word of the Lord is you'll get a little better every little step you take. You'll get a little stronger every little step you take. You'll get a little richer every step you take. You'll get a little more restored every step you take take. You can't allow the pain of the past and what's fallen off of you and what's discombobulated and what hasn't worked. You can't allow you to keep you. You can't allow that to keep you from moving forward. When a word of God comes, when an instruction from God comes and you have the faith to push past the pain and take a step. The, the funny thing about miracles is they sneak up on you sometimes. You know, I've had God heal me and not even be able to tell you exactly the day that he did it. I've had some, you know, something going on and I'm praying about it, 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 praying about it. And then one day just, you know, it snuck up on me. I, I just kept walking in the faith, kept walking in now faith, kept walking in the word. And all of a sudden, while I was walking, as they went. They were cleansed. So look, I know you ain't got it all together. Do it anyway. And do it now. I know some stuff is falling apart on you. Do it anyway. And do it now. I know it's painful to move in this season of life that you're in right now. But do it anyway. And do it now. And if you'll do it now... Every little step you take, you'll get better. Every little step you take, you'll get stronger. Every little step you take, more opportunities will come. Every little step you take will increase you. Now, this was the message. Faith is always now. This was the prophecy. Do it now. If you go home and sit on this, it ain't my fault. You know what's so funny about it? That I'm sure they thought when he said, go show yourself to the priest, that the priest was going to have some, you know, major anointing to heal him. You know, I'm sure they thought the healing was at the destination. But the healing was on the way. You know, you know you're expecting the miracle to show up when you get to that mysterious place called there. No, the miracle happens along the way. And you've been letting that pain of what you lost keep you sidelined in the colony with people with the same issues as you for too long. God said, get out of there. Come out from among them and be ye separate. Come out and do it now. Take your steps. Follow your dreams. Dare to believe God for more. Step out in faith and do it now. Before time takes the mobility of your legs. Do it now. Before your back won't straighten all the way out, do it now. Before you lose your eyesight, do it now. Before you lose the strength in your voice or the brightness in your eyes, do it now. How long will you sit in the colony? I know the colony has its appeal because at least they understand. And it's hard to go through life surrounded by people who don't understand you. And there is a certain comfort in being around your own kind. But you can never be more than you are surrounded by what you are. You got to come out of the colony. You got to come out of the colony. And you got to do it now. And when you come out and you start taking steps to go, 
in the word that Jesus gave you, the colony will always whisper to the back of your mind, come back. It's at least it's safe here. What, what if it don't work? What if the priest throws you back out again? What if you lose more stuff along the way? The colony will always whisper to your mind that you should come back. That is the voice of your enemy trying to send a new wave of threats to your now to pull you out of now faith. God said no. If you'll keep stepping according to my word, if you keep putting one foot in front of the other, it will work. But you got to do it. Give the Lord a praise all over the house this morning. I don't know who this word was for, but use it, honey. Use it. Apply it. Live in it. Walk in it. Listen to it again over and over. Whatever you do, just... just just do it. Do it now. Do it now. Do it now. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you'll bind this word up in their hearts, that you'll strengthen them, that you'll give them the knowledge, the revelation knowledge, that with God all to them that believe that they do it now in Jesus name we're going to do a giving challenge real quick in fact in fact let me fix something with that just take your seat real quick two minutes promise be out two minutes just let, let's talk about giving real quick just give me your attention one more time because a lot of you um, are missing this. H hold the music or I'll start singing. There's, there's only three types of giving according to the scripture, right? Number one, there's tithing, okay? And each of these, each of these three types of giving have a motivation behind it, okay? Tithing, number one. The motivation for tithing is obedience, Okay, because the scripture, the scripture says you don't really give the tithe, you return it. Okay, the scriptural teaching on that is God said 10% of what I've blessed you with belongs to me. 10% of your income, God said, belongs to me. When you don't give God the 10% of your income that he said belongs to him, Malachi 3, he tells the people, you've robbed me, right? How could he say you've robbed me? if it wasn't his to begin with. So tithing is not giving. When you give 10% of your weekly paycheck or your biweekly paycheck, that's not really giving. That's being obedient and faithful to return to God what he said was his, right? So that's not giving. The second type of giving is offerings. Now, the motivation for offering is adoration and love. You don't have to give God an offering. The scripture does not command it, and God doesn't ask for it. You give God an offering out of adoration and love. You know, like, like if you love your spouse, sometimes you'll get them something. You know, you just want to give them something. Uh, I didn't get a lot of amens on that. Glory to God. I'll be praying for your marriages. Um, you know, but, but giving, giving an offering. Listen, 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 listen. It's important. Giving an offering, when you give God an offering, you don't want anything back. Like if I give my wife a gift, it's not because I want something back or I'm going to ask for something later. Wink, wink. Because that's manipulation. That's not adoration, right? So. You give God the tithe out, or you return to God the tithe out of obedience. You give God your offerings out of adoration just because you love him. God, I love you, and I want to give you something. But then number three, the third type of giving is seed sowing. Now listen, when you all come and talk to me, I'm telling you this now. Uh, don't, 
come and misconstrue those three things. They're three completely different kind of things. When you sow a seed, the motivation for that, for sowing a seed, is faith in expectation of harvest. Right. So when you come to give your tithe, don't call that an offering. That's not your offering. You're not offering that. You're returning it. When you give an offering of adoration, don't call it a seed. And when you give it a seed, don't call it an offering. Those are three different things. Why does your church take up two offerings every Sunday? We don't, dummy. Are you deaf? In the beginning of the service, we give people an opportunity to return to God what belongs to him and prove their faithfulness and obedience to his word. That's tithing. If you're not doing that, you're robbing God. God still loves you. God will forgive you. You can go to heaven, but you're robbing God, and God said your finances are cursed. In other words, there's a cap on you that you'll never be able to get over as long as you keep taking what God said belongs to him. And when you fail to tithe, you only do it for one or two reasons. Either, number one, you don't believe what the Bible says, or number two, you don't trust that God is able to sustain you if you put him first. So that, that's tithing. Giving adoration. I don't want nothing back. I just, I'm giving an offering because I love you. Seed sowing, I need something in the natural that I cannot provide for myself. But I do have faith in the kingdom of God, and I'm going to use my faith as currency, and I'm going to sow what I do have toward the need of the thing I don't have. And I'm going to place that seed into the kingdom of God in financial form by faith. Okay? And I'm expecting the return of a harvest. No farmer ever sows a seed without the expectation of a return on the harvest. Jesus guarantees a return, but the return is dependent on the quantity of seed sown. He said some 30-fold will be the harvest, or 30 times what was sown, some 60 times what was sown, some 100 times what was sown. So there's always supposed to be on your part, because remember, the motivation for sowing financially, it, you're not sowing because, God, I love you, and I just want to give you. No, you're sowing because you're expecting a manifestation of a harvest in the natural, but you're going to the supernatural to get it. You understand what I'm saying? You're using faith as that currency of exchange. And so because faith is the motivation for seed sowing, when you're seed sowing, you don't need to be flippant about it. I, I don't sow a seed into the kingdom of God every week. Now I'll give my tithe and I'll give my offerings of adoration, but I don't sow a seed in the kingdom of God every week because I don't have a need that I can't take care of every week. I sow seed into the kingdom of God when I have a natural need I can't take care of. That's what seed faith is all about. That's what seed sowing is for. Okay, do you understand what I'm saying? Now, this is a principle. We're about to, we're about to do this in a second. And I promise you, we have never not needed your money more than we do right now in this ministry. We good. If it's for you, it's for you. If it's not, it's not. And I love you, and I'm glad you got the message. But there's some people here that have a need you cannot provide for in the natural. And you need this revelation of seed faith, seed sowing. What you do is by faith, you get an amount that moves you, that is sacrificial to you. Because Paul said, if you sow sparingly, you will reap, but you'll reap sparingly. Okay? Now, sparingly there deals with the level of sacrifice involved in the sowing. Okay? So, uh, the last year in the pandemic, my little side business that I have, consulting and doing some speaking and some writing for people, it dried up to nothing. No one was having me come in. No one was having me do consults and all that kind of stuff. And uh, my, my little business went to the tank. And so I, I couldn't fix it, you know, because I can't reverse the whole pandemic. And, uh, and I can't make people have me, so I sowed a seed. And it wasn't, it wasn't my tithe, and it wasn't an offering of adoration. 
It was, God, I need some business to come into this thing. I need to keep this thing alive. I'm sowing this into the kingdom of God by faith. I'm picking an amount that is sacrificial to me, and I'm believing you for a harvest, okay? God, in 2020, pandemic, caused $60,000 to come into my business. I know you can't clap because it wasn't your business. But I clapped a lot because it was my little business. And $60,000 may not mean anything to you. It meant a lot to me. It was a blessing to me. God started having people call me to come on Zoom meetings. And I thought I was just on the Zoom meeting. But they'd start sending me money and, and wanting me to, to write stuff and send it to them. And, and the Lord just started blessing my business. And it, was, it wasn't random. It was the harvest on a specific seed that I sowed in faith. When you're sowing a seed, you always want to name the seed. What are you expecting with this seed? And then you always want to check yourself and make sure the level of sacrifice matches the level of the ask. You know what I'm saying? You, you, you want to make sure. And, you know, as you grow in your life and as you grow in your finances, as you grow in your faith, if your amounts never change, if they never go up, that, that means you've not matured in your place of sacrifice. And we should grow from faith to faith. We should grow in knowledge of the word. We should grow in our worship. We should also grow in our sacrifice. So, you know, if you were sowing the same amount of seeds that you were sowing 10 years ago and you're sowing that now, you've, you've not matured past that. And that could be a problem. So in recap, there's only three types of giving that we can do to the Lord, financially speaking. The tithe is returning. The offering is adoration with no expectation in return. And then the seed is when you need something, when you need something that you cannot provide in this natural sense, you go to the kingdom of God by faith, sacrificially, an amount that, that squeezes you, an amount that is a sacrifice for you. And you sow that in expectation. Then you write down what you sowed, you name it, and you pray about it. You know, you water your seed. You pray about it. You remind heaven about it. God, I got seed in the ground. God, I'm believing you for a miracle in my life in this area. And you continue to pour over that thing and then believe God for your harvest and your harvest will manifest. You know, uh, some harvests can take longer than others. I, I received a harvest a couple of months ago on a seed that I sowed years ago, you know, and have just kept that thing before the Lord. So I wanted you to know that because right now when you have a service like this and a word like this, the ground has been plowed in the spirit for faith response, for someone to put their faith in action. Last year, when it came time for me to sow, we had no idea what was going to happen with the church. Uh, we were still on the parking lot. And quite frankly, I just thought most of y'all would leave when we had to go out to the parking lot. I, I didn't think that y'all would, you know, I was worried about it. <laughs> I was worried about it. I didn't know what was going to happen with the church. My own business was <clears throat> in the tank. And it came time for me to sow. But um, I couldn't sow a couple hundred dollars. I, I've learned with large big needs. I've learned that something breaks. Something just breaks open. There's something supernatural about a thousand dollar seed. So I, I sowed a thousand dollar seed. We had a health condition in the family early this year and there wasn't a real clear answer for it. I sowed a thousand dollar seed. The, the times in my life where there have been, um, things I needed to break, I had to get to that level in my faith where I wasn't, I wasn't giving out of my mind or giving out of coercion or being talked into it. I had to get to the place where what I was giving, I was giving out of faith, that the money was coming from a place where I had to believe God and I had to have faith. Now, that's me. That, that's the level that I had to get to. For some people, you know, $100, $500. For some people, $50. It's not necessarily the amount. It's the sacrifice it takes to give it up. Now, don't, don't, don't leave me on this because you may come into a situation in your life where you need this one day. It's, it's not about the amount so much 
it's, it's what it, it pulls up in you to release that amount. Okay, that's what seed faith is all about. So I came today to give you a word and to give you an instruction. Just like Jesus, he gave the lepers a word and an instruction. I came to give you a word and an instruction. And I'm praying you use the faith that you have sitting in you right now that was given by the word preached. And I'm praying you'll do it now. I'm praying everyone under the sound of my voice. I'm just praying. I'm praying you do it now. I want the results to happen for you. I want the harvest to come in for you. I want God to blow your mind with what he does when you trust in his word and his kingdom. I want everybody, even if you don't normally do it, I want everybody to get an envelope in your hand. Just reach and get an envelope right now. Do it 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 now. Everybody, come on, do it now. If the word halfway hits you, if the word was halfway talking to you today, do it now. Get an envelope in your hand. Get an envelope in your hand. Now listen, now listen, whether, whether you came in late and you haven't given your tithe yet, you can, you can do that. Or if you have a, just maybe you don't need anything to sow a, a, a seed faith type deal. Just give an offering of adoration, whatever you want. But for those of you who have a big need, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to search inside and, and come up with an amount that represents faith for that trial that you're going through. You know, for, for instance, I, I, I don't love telling people what to give unless the Holy Spirit charges me to do it. But I mean, I could tell you just prophetically, I know there's 10 people in here that need to give a thousand dollar seed uh, for what you're facing, for what you're going through. Uh, there's 10 of you. I just, I can feel it. I'd call you out. I don't want to make a spectacle out of you. There's 10 people, a $1,000 seed. Uh, there's, there's as many as 40 or 50 people that need to sow a $150 seed. There's, there's people that you would have more faith than all of them if you gave 70 today because things have been so difficult. Again, not the amount so much, the sacrifice it takes to release it. You name your seed. What is this for? And you can either write it on your envelope or you can just write it down on a piece of paper when you get home. And every day you wake up, you pray over that seed and you call in that harvest and you stay in now faith and God will blow your mind. But I'm telling you, it's time to go for that big thing. It's time to go for that dream. It's time to go for what you've been putting off. It's time to reach for what you thought you were too little to reach for. And man, you started on the platform of a seed in faith. God will blow your mind. I'm, I'm talking to somebody maybe you've never given, or maybe you've never given more than $10 or $20. You've never given on a significant level. Try this stuff. I'm not telling you this because the church needs it. We don't have one financial need as a church. Not one right now. Not one. God's been good to us. This sounds crazy, but I'm telling you this for you because I want you to have the benefit and receive the response of it in your life. What is it for you? What is it for you? What's your seed? What's it look like? What's its name? What's its amount? What do you believe in the harvest to be? What is it? What is it? Paul said, so sparingly reap sparingly, so bountifully reap bountifully. Father, in the name of Jesus, you see the faith in the hearts of these people who are preparing a special seed offering, a seed faith gift into the kingdom of God. And Lord, they love you, but, but they're expecting a harvest on this one. They're, they're expecting something. They're counting on your principles that you gave us in your word. They're counting on those to come to pass in this situation. And Lord, you told me to preach this because I know you want to bless them. I know you want to send prosperity to their now faith. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, as they reach in their faith, as they reach in their sacrifice, as they 
reach trusting you. I pray that as they go, even as they leave this place, as they go, as they walk, they'll start getting stronger and stronger and their harvest will come to them and be revealed in full manifestation of the things they are hoping for. And God, all of these things I ask according to your word. I know your promise is sealed forever and it's yes and amen to those who believe. So we stand together, God, in now faith with our offering whatever they may be, whatever motivation may be behind them. We stand all over this building right now. We have it ready for you, Father. We have it ready to plant into your kingdom. We lift up our envelopes or we lift up our phones. We lift up our seeds. We lift up our hearts. We lift up our expectations to you, God, and we receive what you release to us. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. God bless you if you have.